Well, let me um, uh, open up by just talking about the, the, the two faces of technology. Um, so on the one hand, what you have is an unprecedented time at which the American people have the ability to access their legislatures, to access the process of uh, actually writing the code that governs our country. Um, on the other hand, you've got a divide, whether it's the digital divide or actually the entire process by which uh, legislation is created, language that no one can really understand, the average person doesn't really get. Um, and also, in the context of platforms, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. But in, in terms of the, the opportunity, um, as you saw President Obama during his election uh, or campaign process, uh, he was able to raise online over half a billion dollars uh, with the average uh, contribution being over, under $100. So he had the ability to mobilize an entire community. In the same way, we have a unique opportunity that hasn't really been leveraged, uh, which is engaging the American people in the legislative process in terms of thinking through, you know, how would you write pieces of legislation? How can you use these new platforms that have never existed before to really empower the American people? And how do we even rethink the process of actually writing legislation, having people improve it over time? Imagine a world where you've got a, almost like a Wikipedia as you think about some of these really, really complex issues. And as complexity increases, the way to solve it is to bring in the brain trust across the country to tackle on some of the most difficult problems. Yet, I wish we had, uh, when it comes to spending, a TCPIP protocol for how the United States government actually spends money. So a couple of issues that, uh, that I've been dealing with directly, I remember sort of day one on the job, uh, having to think about a common architecture of how we would track recovery spending across the country, a nationwide system. And what we learned very quickly was there wasn't a common architecture for program codes. There wasn't really a common architecture at the federal, state, and local level. Uh, as the federal government, through the legislative process, begins to appropriate billions of dollars in funding. And we've done a lot more work in that space uh, when it comes to USSpending.gov. We just launched um, last month a new version, a new platform. And part of what we try to do is model that platform very simple, very much like a Google or a Bing or a Yahoo, where you could literally go online, you could go online today and type the word wine, and you could see you'll get an image of a map, a national map that will show you where the United States government is spending money on wine. Uh, is that which w department? W-I. -E? -E? <laughs> and uh, which uh, localities we're buying from. But the challenge has been it's taken so much effort on the back end because, to your point um, and to what Tim was talking about, in terms of how this funding is appropriated. So, so there isn't a common architecture as we think about how the government spends. Also, there isn't necessarily a common architecture when we think about performance. So after you move from policy formulation um, and where legislation passes to actually execution, where you're literally trying to implement programs, what we've noticed is a huge gap in terms of uh, being able to shine light in those areas. So we've done that in a small part uh, for the 76 plus billion dollars um, around the IT budget, where we're literally uh, putting online the picture of all the CIOs you're talking about um, next to the projects that they're responsible for, um, and uh, how those projects are performing in terms of cost, in terms of schedule, in terms of the stated outcomes up front when the agencies went in front of Congress to ask for that funding, to really shine light so we can see and learn in terms of lessons as far as what works, what doesn't work, evidence-based approach um, to implementation. The other area in terms of platforms or recognizing is uh, to Tim's earlier point, which is Apple created a platform. The same way what we've done is we've created a platform called data.gov. And what data.gov uh, does, it actually takes the vast array of storage or information that we have within the federal government, 
without compromising national security or privacy of the American people, we're trying to democratize that information. And we're finding um, some really, really innovative uses of government data. Um, we've talked about before the revolution that was unleashed when the federal government decided to release GPS data, uh, where all of a sudden you have GPS devices on your iPhone and the ability to navigate a new city or town or going to your local car store and actually getting a GPS device. In the same way, what we're seeing, simple innovations. For example, the Health and Human Services Department for years has had a site called uh, uh, Compare, which essentially allows you to compare the outcomes. Those hospital compare, which allows you to see customer satisfaction in terms of patient satisfaction by hospital, outcomes by hospital. But it's one out of 24,000 websites uh, in the US government and had very little foot traffic. As soon as we democratized that data and made it available in machine readable format, what happened is uh, companies like Google and Bing uh, took that raw data. And Bing, for example, now if you go there and you, and you search for Sibley Hospital or Shady Grove Hospital or any hospital in the country, Right there, you can see the patient outcomes of the hospital, how people have rated it, um, and that's really putting information at the fingertips of the American people so they can make intelligent choices. And we expect as legislation passes in different laws and different domains, imagine the ability to take that raw data or that information and think about the government almost like a platform in the context of a grocery store where anybody could take that data, uh, mix the ingredients, and create all sorts of magic. So we saw that not just with the uh, data we released at the health and human services level, but also FAA data. We've got a community of developers at RPI who've built over 40 applications, uh, from applications that look at uh, White House visitor logs and actually visualize uh, who was visiting when and all the news stories associated uh, during that time to taking data that, uh, that has to do with the U.S. government budget and uh, looking at what were the hot stories at the time the budget was being deliberated. So there's unprecedented opportunity when we, when we look at the intersection of uh, cheap compute power uh, and, the, and the deployment of broadband, which for the first time has given the American people a front row seat to their government. Imagine what happened in the Agora. It used to be that people would petition their government by convening at the um, town center, a public square, whether it was to socialize or to discuss issues of the day. Now, anybody, anywhere in the country, has the ability um, to, to petition their government, to contribute, to challenge, and to actually hold us accountable. And part of what we're trying to do is look at this in terms of the whole ecosystem, from policy development uh, to actually the legislative process when laws get passed, but most importantly, the implementation. How do we make sure that we're shining more, and more light and uh, releasing more and more information around the implementation uh, part of uh, the legislative process? Because once we know what works, we can continue to do more of that and divest from those things that don't work.